in your Schofield Bible, page 948. Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah. Beginning with the fourth verse, we'll read responsibly through the ninth verse, the ninth verse being the text verse for this evening's message. Micah chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, page 948. And let's stand, please, for the reading of this passage. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Let's pray. And Lord, we thank you so for our church. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for the service. Thank you for the preaching. Thank you for all that you have in mind and help us to know what you have in mind so that we can please thee. We pray that you'd help our preacher very specially, bless him with thy power tonight. And we pray that you'd help us each to do our part, that is to listen and to apply the truths of thy word. In Jesus' name, amen. Just in case somebody's going to take a picture during my sermon, you're not going to do it. You'll never see 1990. Uh, I want you to put your cameras up now. Though I certainly would understand why you would want to take a picture. But if you will refrain, if you'll refrain from taking a picture now, I will pose in the alley with my shirt off like this after the service is over. And uh, we'll let you take my picture. And then, I think I will. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we come to the last message of a great year made great because 1,019 more people were baptized this year than last year plus what we baptized tonight made great because in every way our church is stronger than it was a year ago tonight made great because our faith is stronger because many of our people and we as a church have had some times of shaking this year but the old church marches on thank you for it now bless us tonight in this last public service of this year in the closing hours of the year in Jesus name Amen the reckoning day had come the prophets were right Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty army rolls into Jerusalem King Zedekiah runs from the assault and attack he was caught near the plains of Jericho by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar he was brought to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon he was tried found guilty his sons were slain before his eyes they put out his eyes after his sons were slain before him they bound him with fetters and took him to Babylon for the first time since Saul Israel God's God's people had no king 
Then comes this statement. Is there no king in thee? Is there no king in thee? How sad. The throne was destroyed on which the king had sat. His crown graced no one's brow. His scepter was held by no one's hand. His robe covered no one's body. For the first time since the ki King Saul had been chosen to become the first king, God's people had no king. This little statement is a statement that I've used for many years as one of the motto verses of my life. A dear friend reminded me of this, this statement, and I thought about it, and I realized that I'd never preached a sermon on this statement. Is there no king in thee? I've used it for many years, along with about a half a dozen other scriptures, as one of the most important of the scriptures, sort of my motto scriptures, if you please. Of course, the statement, is there no king in thee, could be applied to abortion. I wonder how many kings have been murdered by wicked doctors. I wonder how many kings have been killed. I wonder how many Winston Churchills have been killed by wicked doctors. I wonder how many Charles Spurgeons have been slaughtered and murdered by godless mothers. There may be a king that you're thinking about killing or aborting. And certainly, certainly, our scripture would apply. Is there no king in thee? It also could be applied to a Sunday school class. You look at that little class and you ask yourself a question. Is there no king in thee? I marvel at how lightly we take our responsibilities. I marvel that the Christian schoolroom is more important than many, to many of you than the, than the Sunday school room is. I marvel how lightly you're gone on Sunday and how you will never be gone when you're on a school day. I've said it before, I'll say it again. The Sunday school of First Baptist Church of Hammond is ten times as important as the schoolroom at Howells Anderson College. And ten times as important as the schoolroom in Hammond Baptist Schools. I marvel, I marvel at how lightly we take our responsibility as Sunday school teachers. I wish you'd look at that class, look at the role of that class and ask the question, is there no king in thee? Mr. Kimball walked up and down the front of a shoe store in Boston years ago to visit a Sunday school class member just to try to get him to be faithful to Sunday school. He could have asked himself the question, is there no king in thee? There was a king in that shoe store. His name was Dwight L. Moody. I wonder how many Dwight Moody's have not become Dwight Moody's because Sunday school teachers were careless about their attendance, their concern about their classes. I wonder, young ladies, be, be listen to me now, right back here, listen to me now. I wonder, is there no king in thee? I wish I could get the Sunday school teachers of the First Baptist Church of Hammond to realize how important your job is. You wouldn't lightly take off and lightly just not be here. There are kings out there in those classes that'll never wear a crown because of unfaithful, careless Sunday school teachers and unconcerned Sunday school teachers. Is there no king in thee? Daisy Hawes was a Sunday school teacher in Louisville, Kentucky. Daisy Hawes had a class of boys, of all things, teenage boys. Daisy Hawes was concerned about those boys and there was a king in her class. She did not know it then, but there was a king in her class. His name was Lee Robertson. Is there no king in thee? Oh, if I could have one thing in this church, I'd like for the folks who hold positions of responsibility to realize the importance of your job and your task. It could be applied not only to abortion, not only to a Sunday school class, but it could be applied to a congregation. Little did that layman realize that snowy morning in England when only 15 people showed up that there was a king back there in the gallery. That layman had no sermon because the snowstorm was, uh, was, w w did not keep him from coming, but the pastor couldn't get there because of uh, the snowstorm. And they asked the layman if he had preached. Only 15 people showed up, and back in the gallery was the 15-year-old lad. And the, the, the preacher just got up and spoke a while on look unto him, look unto him. 
And he said, young man back in the gallery, whoever you are, look unto Jesus and be saved. And that young man, a king, was back there in the gallery. Only 15 people there, but one of them was the king. They're kings here tonight. The man was right who said, be kind to your paper boy. You may work for him someday. Be kind to the fellow, to the boy that mows your yard. He may be the judge in which you, before whom you appear someday. If I could get God's people to realize there are kings out there. There are kings out there. <coughs> Charles Haddon Spurgeon was that young man, the prince of preachers and probably the greatest preacher since the apostle Paul. There was a king out there. Is there no king in thee. I stood before 80 people one night in, 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 in Atlanta, Georgia. And by the way, I don't care if I'm preaching to 80 people or 8,000 people, I always give it my best. I was preaching <coughs> in uh, <coughs> Alamogordo, New Mexico this week. And of course, during the Christmas season, the crowds are always the smallest. About 140 people are there on Thursday night and about 140 people again on Friday night. But I gave it my best. I preached just like I was preaching at a, at, a, at a convention to several thousand people. Why? Because there may be kings out there. I look at every crowd where I preach and wonder and ask God to give me somebody from that crowd to be a great servant of the, of the Most High God. That night before 80 people in Atlanta, Georgia, I preached. Did not know it, but I gave my best, just like I was preaching to a great crowd of thousands. And sitting in that building that night was a young man pastoring a church with 20 in attendance who had to work secularly to make a living, had never won a soul in his life, never won a soul in his life. And that night while I was preaching, there was a king out there. And God gave us Curtis Hudson that night who got right with God and built the biggest church in the state of Georgia of any kind. I'm saying, <laughs> everywhere I preach, if I could get <coughs> every preacher, every preacher, if I could get every preacher in America who stands before his people to realize that there may be a king out there in that little crowd of 50 people. There may be a king out there. Is there no king in thee? I could also apply it not only to abortion, not only to a Sunday school class, not only to a congregation, but I could apply it to a soul winner. That next door house you knock on, ask the question, is there no king in thee? Is there no great preacher inside that house? Oh, I know it's a messy little place, or I know it's an old junky apartment, and I know it's in a ghetto area maybe, but ask yourself, is there no king in thee? Is there no king in thee? I was out soul winning <coughs> one day, one afternoon, 40 years ago, about, knocked on the door, won two young teenage young, young, young ladies to Christ. One of them now has been a missionary in South America and Central America for many years. Her name is Kathy John Gunter, Mrs. John Gunter. I wanted to Christ. Is there no king in the... I wish you could, I wish you could take it more than just knocking on the door and fulfilling responsibility, though that certainly is adequate, but I wish you could stop and realize exactly how big this thing is. Hey, there are kings sitting over here in this bus section. Hey, there may be kings sitting up there in the rescue mission section. Hey, there may be kings sitting over here in the public, the public school kids. Hey, there may be kings sitting back there with the deaf. I mean, there are kings in this building, and I'm not going to come and lackadaisically give a half-hearted effort. I'm going to give all I have. Why? Because there are kings out there. I want to find them. Is there no king in thee? I recall one day, good night, has been many, many years ago. I imagine it's been 27, 28 years ago. I was out visiting over, I think it was East Chicago. If it wasn't, it was North Hammond. Knocked on the door and a man came to the door. He's sitting here tonight. I feel sure if he's not, he almost always is, always here just about. And he was sitting and, and knocked on the door. And that man came to the door. And that man had some little children there. Well, I did not know it, that, that who was in there, but the wife of Ray Young was in there as a little girl that night. And one of our finest young laymen was in there. And Evangelist Keith, Keith Whitehouse, a little boy that night, was in there. When you go soul winning, look for the kings. Is there no king in that house? I'll keep on knocking till I find a king. Is there no king in this crowd? I'll keep on preaching till I find a king. Is there no king in my Sunday school class? I'll keep on teaching till I find a king. Is there no king in my congregation? I'll keep on preaching till I find a king. Uh, to a mother, to a mother I say, is there no king in thee? 
You don't know what that little snotty-nosed boy is. There may be a king beating in that breast. Train him and teach him. Is there no king in thee, Susanna Wesley? Is there no king in thee? Those 22 children or so you've got, 20 children, 17th I think it was, was a young boy named John. And as she took him one hour every Thursday night and taught him the things of God for one hour every Thursday night, she did not know that she had the great John Wesley on her knee when she taught him. There was a king there. You don't know. You don't know. Teach your class as if there was a king in thee. Teach, preach your sermon as if there were a king in thee. Go soul winning as if there were a king inside that house. Train your children as if there were a king sitting on your knee. But the main thing that I'd like to emphasize tonight, and I mean this when I say that my message will not be lengthy tonight, the main thing I'd like to emphasize is this. Take the verse literally. Is there no king in thee? There is royalty in every person in this room tonight. But you don't realize it. I mean, there's king inside you. Christ in me, the hope of glory. There's a king in me. I say tonight, what happened to the king in you? What happened to the king in you? I ask that question to preachers. What happened to the king and preachers across America? It was Sam Jones, who many years ago was a circuit riding preacher. Went to a workers conference one day. He was just a common, simple preacher, pastored several churches. In the old days, they used to have a circuit of churches because one church couldn't pay you a salary. I'm thinking about getting another one this year, my coming year myself. <laughs> but those days, a fellow, back when I used to pastor two churches years ago, I never told you about that, but for a while, I pastored two churches down in East Texas. I preached at one on Sunday morning and Sunday night and one on Sunday afternoon. But I, uh, uh, I, uh, Sam Jones went to, to a workers' conference. Just a common average preacher. Riding on horseback when this conference ended, he said to his preacher friend, I learned something this morning. The friend said, what did you learn, Sam? Sam Jones said, the preacher said something this morning I'll never forget. He said, the pulpit's a throne, and I'm a king. The pulpit's a throne, and I'm a king. And he said, next Sunday morning, there'll be a king in my pulpit, and my pulpit will be a throne. And next Sunday, I'm ascending the royal stairway to royalty as I become not just a little preacher, but a king. And that one thing transformed the life of Sam Jones. Those early days when preachers first start out, there's king in them. A lot of, uh, lot of wrong in them too. A lot of uh, mistakes in them. But there's king in them. There's royalty in them. That's why God blesses them. I was talking the other day about some dumb things I did when I was a young preacher. I mean like young, like 62 and 61 and 60. But, but I don't know why God didn't strike me dead. Yes, I do know why God didn't strike me dead. Because God looked down and said, though that young man is a novice and he's green and he makes some mistakes, he's sincere and there's some king in that young man and I'm not going to stifle him. I'm going to bless him and help him. He's sincere. He's doing the best he can. And America needs no... America needs nothing tonight like she needs kings in the pulpit. I say to the preachers in America, is there no king in thee? I say to pastors tonight who spent 15 minutes uh, uh, getting somebody else's little outline from handfuls of purpose maybe, is there no king in thee? I say to preachers tonight who anybody that comes in there to visit their service, a visiting preacher or missionary, they'll still say, come on up and preach for me. I say, is there no king in thee? I mean the President of the United States every time somebody comes by doesn't say come and address Congress for me. The Supreme Court Chief Justice, every time somebody comes in the courtroom, he knows. He doesn't say, come on up here and make this decision for me. I am saying America needs a generation of preachers who have king inside of them. And oh, young men start preaching and they have king inside of them. And yet what happens? Those early days, a bit reckless maybe, and a bit foolish maybe, but there was king inside the preacher. And I see him all over the country who've lost the king. There's no king in them anymore. There's no vision for the future. No courage to fight. 
No chain, uh, changing, uh, or no, uh, the changing of convictions even. Stopping of the bus ministry. Quitting of the soul winning. No longer have a cause. I could stand here tonight and I could count by the dozens preachers where I used to preach in churches when I was younger. And these men, when they were my age, we grew up together. And these men had king in them. But they've gotten old, they've gotten tired. They're afraid to fight anymore. Get the king back inside of you. They don't have the soul winning churches anymore. Get the king back inside of you. I say tonight to preachers of America, is there no king in thee? Dr. Elmer Towns made a statement several years ago that I didn't believe when I heard it. I believe it now, at least nearly. He said that he hardly knows a preacher in America whose church continued to grow after the preacher became 40 years of age. I was stunned when I heard that, and I said, Elmer, that couldn't be true. But the longer I've observed, the more I realize it is true. A preacher, when he gets 40 years of age, he sometimes loses his, his royalty. The king leaves him. He wants to be secure. He wants to quit fighting. He's tired and he's weary. Oh, let me tell you something, young men of God, been called of God and proclaimed the message of God. Don't ever lose the royalty on the inside of you. Is there no king in thee? I remember preaching with a king for years, Dr. John Rice. I saw him past 60 and 70 and 80, but brother, there was still royalty. His crown was solid, solidly set upon his head all the way through his ministry. I remember that last sermon he preached in Wadsworth, Ohio, last one he preached with me in a Bible conference. It, he had, been, it had a heart attack and a stroke, and he called me on the phone and said, Brother Hiles, let's try it again for old time's sake. Boy, was I ever glad to hear that. We went to Wadsworth, Ohio, and after several couple of years, I guess, we had the first conference we'd had together for a couple of years. I stood over here on this side as Dr. Rice preached that night. He forgot his sermon. His mind wandered. He'd preach a while on one subject and preach on another subject. And I sat there and cried. All of us cried. The people that didn't know him, the young kids, laughed and made fun of him. But those of us who knew him and loved him realized we were hearing Dr. John Rice preach for the last time. But brother, I don't care if he forgot his sermon. There was a, th a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand and a robe of royalty around his shoulders and there was king there. Those who saw him when he preached his last sermon, it was to a ladies' meeting in Wadsworth, Ohio. One of the funniest things you ever heard of in your life. Dr. Rice was preaching that night to a bunch of ladies or that day or night to a bunch of ladies. And he preached on one sermon, gave the invitation on, on, on the sermon. Then during the invitation, he forgot, he forgot what he'd preached on. He thought he'd preached on something else. He preached on one sermon, but he thought he'd preached on John the Baptist and how Elizabeth prayed for a husband, a son, and God gave her a son. So he said, all you ladies, you want me to pray for you about the sermon he preached about, stand up. They stood up. Then Dr. Rice's mind snapped, and he went back to the sermon on John the Baptist and thought he'd preach that. So he said, oh, God, give all these ladies who are standing up babies. <laughs> they said it looked like a machine gun had knocked them down, popped down all over the building. <laughs> if you knew John Rice like I do, if you were 75 years old, he prayed you'd have a baby, you'd be afraid you might. But the old man never lost his zeal. He never lost his spunk. He never lost his fire. He never lost his compassion. He never lost his love. In God's name, don't lose your, don't lose your royalty. Is there no king in thee? I say not only to preachers, but I say it to fathers tonight. What's wrong with the American male? I'll tell you exactly what's wrong with the American male. There's no king in him anymore. There's no king in him. Is there no king in thee? Where are the fathers who say with Joshua, as for me and my house, we'll serve God, thank you. By the way, he didn't say, he didn't say, I'll check with my kids and see if they'll serve God. He said, we'll serve God. He didn't say, I'll check with my wife and see if she'll serve God. He said, I'll answer with my wife, she'll serve God. How do you know? I'll see to it she serves God. Well, how about your children? I'll take care of that too. As for me and my house, we'll serve God. You know what's wrong with America? We need some men and heads of houses who have some king on the inside of them. Our pulpits have little mealy mouth pussyfooters. Our, our, our homes have little mealy mouth pussyfooters. God give us some men who have king inside of them. 
God, give us some men who can turn the TV to the off position. Some men who walk with God. Some men who provide for their own. Some men who pay their debts on time. We have a generation of playboys, golfers, bowlers, country clubbers, athletic clubbers, handballers, paddle ballers. I'm not against any of those things, but bless God, we need some men who are kings again. Is there no king in thee? Matthew, 20, Matthew 16, 26 says, What should it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What God is saying is this. God is saying that little something on the inside of you, that spark and that zeal and that spunk and that courage and that enthusiasm and that royalty, let it reign on its throne. Is there no king in thee? Look at Elijah under the juniper tree. This is the same Elijah that prayed down fire from heaven. This is the same Elijah that had chopped the heads off 800 prophets of Baal. Boy, I wish I'd have seen that. I wish I'd lived in those days. I'd have got me a sword or an axe and deheaded a few people. But now I see Elijah under the juniper tree, discouraged, lost his king in him. Look at Peter fishing. Same fellow who said, uh, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The same one that was chosen to lead the apostles. And in every list of the apostles, Peter is always mentioned first. He's out there fishing. Naked. Fishing. What's wrong with him? He lost his king inside of him. Look at Jonah under the gourd. Same fellow preached that great revival in a city of 600,000 people turned to God. Every one of them turned to God. Now Jonah's under the gourd, defeated, discouraged, said, let me die. What happened? He lost his royalty. Oh, I wish some of you men had become men again. I'm not talking about some of you little sissy britches fellows going home and saying, your wife, and I'm going to be the boss from now on. She'll throw up on you. <laughs> I'm not talking about talking like a king. I'm talking about becoming a man. Tell you how you can get some authority. Pay your debts. Be honest. I'll tell you, get some authority. Be a man. I don't mean assert yourself as a man. I mean be a man. She'll find it out. Pay your debts. Work. Bear the load. Samson grinding at the mill. What's wrong with Samson? Tell you what's wrong with him. He lost the king in him. But I want to tell you something. Elijah came back and got his king back in him. And he was uh, taken up into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots. Samson came back and got his king back in him when he had that one great closing victory before he died. Peter came back and got his king in him when he stood on Pentecost and preached, uh, Dr. Rice used to say, preached on the corner of, of State and, and uh, some other street in Chicago. Randolph Street in Chicago, but in the back end of a pickup truck, had 3,000 people got saved. He got his king back. Christian, is there no king in thee? She died at 96, and I called her mama, but her crown fit squarely on her head to the last moment. Mrs. Rice went to heaven a few weeks ago, but the last time we saw her, she had royalty in her blood, and she had her crown on her brow. I like to look at some people in this room. I think about the Nymires up here. There's his family sitting right there beside him. There's his kingdom and there's the king. I like that. I like to look over here and see John Woosley. Brother, when, when, his, when his kids come home from, from, uh, from out of town, they sit there with mom and daddy. I like that. And there's his kingdom and there's the king. You don't have to be a preacher to be a king. You don't have to be a king to be a king. You don't have to be a, a mayor of a town to be a king. You don't have to be a president of a college to be a king. Listen, you can be a king if you just be a man. I look at Brother Bordway leading the choir and I see royalty. I look at Randy Erickson on his job here, in charge of the maintenance of our building. He walks down the hallways, not like somebody who uh, who's, uh, has a menial little task with no importance. He walks down the hallway proud. Why? He has king inside of him. For 30 years, I saw Ed Roush, board of our deacons, and never saw him without king in him. He buried Mrs. Loser a few days ago. Mrs. Loser had royalty in her to the end. Ruth Elaine Bartell. 
always wore a crown everywhere she went. Only had two dresses, but she always had that invisible robe on her, that invisible crown of queenliness, and that invisible scepter, always a queen. Our staff men, our administrators, have king in them. Is there no, is there no king in the Sunday school teacher? Why don't you get on your face before God and say with the grace of God, I'm looking at my class every Sunday from this moment forward with that one thing in mind, there may be a king or a queen out there somewhere. Amen. Is there no king in the college teacher? Flippantly go to class maybe. It's your job. It's a duty for you. Every time you walk in the class at Howells Anderson College, you ought to stop and say, there's the next Billy Sunday out there. Pray tell me, if he doesn't come from Howells Anderson College, where is he going to come from? Look at that class. Years ago, there was a headmaster in Germany who went to his class every day and he would bow and take off his hat and bow before his boys. He was a school teacher and sort of a principal school teacher, headmaster. Somebody asked him one time, said, why in the world do you always, every morning, you walk in there and you bow and, and take your head off the presence of those little old kids? Why? He said, because I know not what great learned men sit in my classroom. What he was saying is, there's probably a king out there. And there was. Of course, sitting in his classroom that very morning was a little boy about that high whose name was Martin Luther. I wonder how many, how many cases we'll find at the judgment seat of Martin Luther's who were there who never became Martin Luther's because the Sunday school teacher or the school teacher didn't say there may be a king out there. I wonder how many kings have been aborted. I'm not talking about killing an unborn baby now. I'm talking about killing an unborn king. Karl Marx came to the United States of America. Karl Marx went to New York City and, and, and visited regularly a Baptist church. Karl Marx said he found nothing genuine in those people. One Sunday school teacher who realized there was a king out there could have changed Karl Marx, Marx and changed the Bolshevik Revolution. Mahatma Gandhi, the man who influenced more people than any person in my lifetime. Mahatma Gandhi made the statement when somebody witnessed to him one time about Jesus. He said, I would become a Christian if it were not Christians. I'll tell you what he was saying. He was saying, give me a preacher who realizes there's some king on the inside of him. Give me a Sunday school teacher who has kings in his class. And give me a school teacher, a Hammond Baptist school teacher, a City Baptist school teacher, a Hammond Baptist high school teacher, a Hammond Baptist grade school teacher, a Hammond Baptist junior high school teacher, a Hiles Anderson College teacher who walks to class and doffs his head and bows and says, there are kings out there. I'm going to give it my best. Bus captains, there are kings out there. We've seen it in this decade. We've seen a king in Colonel North, a man indicted and convicted for a crime. As far as I'm concerned, he did, did, did not commit. We've seen that man tried you never saw Mr. North interrogated by a bunch of weaklings interrogating strength or a bunch of crooks interrogating purity. You never saw him one time when he was, when he was being questioned about his activities. You never saw him one time, but what he had, a crown on his head, there was king in him. You can tell it. And Admiral Poindexter came. You could tell a difference. Those other men came. You could tell a difference. Why? There was king in Mr. North. We've seen it in other secular areas. We've seen it in Tom Landry. You don't make them like that anymore. Tell you what happened when Tom Landry was fired. A little peon defrocked the king because he had some money. But in spite of the fact that he was fired and lost his job, you can still see king inside of Tom Landry. We've seen it in Pat Nixon, one of the finest ladies, I think, in our generation outside the Christian field. Let me go ahead and say it. We've seen it in Richard Nixon, who didn't do any more than Mr. Johnson did, any more than Mr. Kennedy did. He just happened to get caught by a bunch of pinkos that wanted him out of office. That's all. 
when you saw him that day on your television screen, if you did, when he said goodbye to his White House staff and he and Pat got on that helicopter, and anybody that had a tear in their soul wept as they saw him wave his hand, there was royalty still there. We've seen it in Lee Robertson. We've seen it in Paul Bear Bryant. Every field we know. What's the difference in Paul Bear Bryant and the other college coaches? There's a king inside of Paul Bear Bryant. The story has been told often from this pulpit. I was on a plane one day flying to North Carolina to Greensboro High Point Airport. Right across from me was a man whose voice I recognized and his face I recognized. He was the basketball coach, University of Kentucky, named Adolph Rupp. I looked over and I said, Mr. by the way, he won more basketball games, still has, I think, than any other man who's ever coached in the college ranks. I said, Mr. Rupp, I said, my name is Jack Hiles. I said, uh, I'm a fan of yours. And he said to me, he said, uh, sir, I'm glad to meet you. With his southern drawl, said, yes, sir. I said, I pastor a church outside of Chicago. He said, yes, sir, I've heard of that great church. That's that large church outside Chicago. We talked on the airplane, talked about his future. He was getting up in years. In fact, he was already 70 at the time. After we chatted for about an hour, we got all, he, he, he got off at Lexington, and I had a little layover, so I, I took a little walk. Well, and got me a paper and went to the washroom. And in the men's room, I looked over and washing his hands in the lavatory beside me was Adolph Rupp again. I said, Mr. Rupp, may I ask you a question? I said, I understand that, um, that there's a, a, a rule or a law in the state of Kentucky that you, you have to retire at 70. A tear invaded his eye, and he said, yes, sir. I said, Mr. Rupp, what will happen to you when you retire? He looked at me, and a tear rolled down his cheeks, and the old coach said, sir, I think I'll die. I think I'll die. He had to retire. Just a few months after I had that conversation, I picked up my Chicago Tribune one day. And the headline said, Adolph Rupp is dead. You know why he died? If he couldn't have the king in him, he didn't want to live. Now you listen to me. It's time that you realize that life is more than a Christmas tree. It's time you realize that life is more than a shopping trip. It's time you realize that life is more than a bowling league or a golf game every Saturday morning. It's time that you realize there's some responsibilities and obligations and responsibilities and com some commitments in life. And it's time this old lazy, playing, picnicking, partying, fun-loving generation realize that life is made of commitments and responsibilities and duties. And to do the right means to be king on the inside of you. We've seen it in Ronald Reagan. We've seen it in Howard Jewell. The old singer that stood up here sang for us with a king's heart. We've seen it in Russell Anderson in this last year. He faced serious cancer surgery. But never while he was having surgery. I stayed in his room all the time he was having surgery and prayed for him because I was preaching not far from there. But never got his throne off his brow. We've seen it in Judge Bork who ought to be on the Supreme Court. If there weren't a bunch of pinkos in the Senate, he would have been on the Supreme Court. We've seen it. Is there no king in thee? You say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to become, I'm going to take the authority of this mind. That's not what king makes kings. You don't become a king because you're bossy. You don't go home and say, okay, I'm taking over. That's not, that's not royalty. You become a king when you do what you're supposed to do in life. When I was pastor of a country church in East Texas, as I was a vouch for this, if she wants to continue eating. <laughs> when I was pastor of a country church in East Texas with a handful of people, I'll guarantee you our services were conducted just like the services are here right now. And I'll guarantee you our teachers and officers meeting were the same way that we, the ones we have now. I mean, when I just had a little handful of people, I mean, brother, it was important. 
And ever for across America, a bunch of preachers are shirking their responsibility, and letting the little churches go to the devil while they're waiting on that big church so someday they can be a king. You don't, be, you don't become a king because you're pastor of a church. God gives you a big pulpit because you already are a king. I was up in Anchorage, Alaska, and I'll close with this. I was up in Anchorage, Alaska the other night, preaching. I said this morning, it has not always been easy for me to walk on platforms in the last eight months when I walk across America and go across America to preach. Friend and foe alike are sitting out there, some to praise me and some to curse me. I finished preaching on Tuesday night, Anchorage, Alaska. Had a wonderful service. <laughs> Every once in a while, a little kingliness would escape from my preaching. I sat down after I'd preached in a wonderful service. Pastor Jerry Prevo came and put his arm on my shoulder. And as they were having the offering, they had the offering at the end, he put his arm on my shoulder and he said, Dr. Tiles, you still got it. You still got it. And I said to him, when I lose it, I want to die. And he said to me, knowing you, if you ever lose it, you will die. Is there no king in thee? Our Heavenly Father, the last sermon of this year is closed. The last message that will come from these lips in 1989 has fallen from the lips of this preacher. Oh, my God in heaven, help us to realize that life is based on responsibilities, obligations. Help us to realize there's more in life than play and fun and laughter and ha-ha and watching ball games. Oh, my soul, we need a generation of men with kings in them, a generation of women with queenly royalty in their breasts, a generation of young people who are royalty. My heads are bowed. I ask you a question tonight. Is there no king in thee?